Hi everyone, uh, thanks for taking the time to um, join with us this morning. Um, uh, so we're hosting a, a quick event to uh, talk about uh, both the ethics of challenge trials uh, and effective altruism advocacy and how that can relate to a petition campaign that One Day Sooner is starting uh, in the UK uh, and a sort of wider publicity campaign that we're, we're planning to start in the UK. So uh, I'm Alistair fraser -Ecker. I I'm moderating the event and I'm thrilled to be joined by uh, both Josh Morrison, who is uh, effect, uh, sorry, is executive director of One Day Sooner, uh, and Professor Singer, who in effective altruism circles <laughs> needs no introduction. Uh, he's a professor of bioethics uh, and kind of was instrumental in, in starting the effective altruism movement. Um, and we're really honoured to have him this morning. Uh, he's also agreed to join the advisory board for One Day Sooner, which we're we're really really thrilled about. Uh, so the basic run of this morning's event um, is. Uh, Josh is going to start with a quick introduction to One Day Sooner and what One Day Sooner does uh, for about 15 minutes um, and then Professor Singer is going to talk for about 15 minutes again on the ethics of challenge trials um, and about effective altruism advocacy. Uh, I'm then going to spend uh, five or so minutes uh, giving a quick introduction to the UK petition um, and the aims behind that uh, and then there'll be 25 minutes of uh, Q&A uh, which we're going to do via a uh, Google form, which I'll put in the chat as soon as I finish talking. Uh, and I'll put that in the chat again when the Q&A starts. Um, and then to finish uh, at about one o'clock, there'll be uh, 20 minutes or so of breakout rooms, which they're optional. Um, they'll be much smaller, so they, they're good for socialising and also for kind of any remaining questions you might have about uh, anything that's been, been talked about uh, or anything wider. So, um, that's the basic introduction to the event. Uh, so I'll hand over to Josh, he'll talk and introduce one day sooner. Josh. Oh, you're, you're still muted, Josh. Uh, all right. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. This is a really great turnout. Um, I'm really excited for this event. Um, I do like to hear myself talk, but I don't know if I'm going to take 15 minutes. I might be a little bit quicker than that. Um, but, uh, but we'll see. So, so basically what I wanted to talk about was um, One Day Sooner and Challenge Trials, um, how kind of we see it as, as fitting into um, effective altruism in general, and I'll, I'll preview a little bit um, this petition campaign that we could uh, use all of your help on. And so what One Day Sooner is, is an organization that advocates on behalf of people who want to participate in a COVID-19 human challenge trial. Uh, so first of all, what's, you know, what's a human challenge trial? It is a uh, experiment where someone gets uh, deliberately exposed to infection as a way of testing um, treatments and vaccines, and also of learning about the disease, uh, a disease itself. And so challenge trials are, you know, they're, they're not widely known about. I actually don't really think I knew about them before, um, before March when I learned about them for, for COVID-19. Um, by reading uh, Nir Eyal and Mark uh, Lipsitch and Peter Smith's article about them. Um, but they're actually used in a, in a number of different infectious diseases, um, and both to study the disease and to uh, learn about vaccines. So for example, um, there are malaria, cholera, and typhoid vaccines that are currently being deployed in which challenge trials played a, a really major role. And scientifically, um, you know, our knowledge of a lot of diseases really comes from challenge trials. I was actually just listening, I was just reading um, a uh, literature review yesterday about our knowledge about um, the immune response and uh, an antibody response to um, SARS-CoV-2 or to coronaviruses in general. And, you know, the, a huge portion of that was, was based on challenge studies that have been done in, among other coronaviruses, among the coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Um, so they're, they're very useful, uh, and I think for an intuitive way, right, which is that normally when we're studying a disease, uh, an infectious disease, we only really can, can study it and find out about it, you know, days after the person's been exposed to, to infection. Um, but there's a huge amount of information that, that's, you know, relevant right from the moment of infection, particularly the immune response. Um, which, which happens, you know, within hours of, of someone being infected. And so it's kind of obvious that, that, you know, deliberately infecting someone, if you can study them in a controlled environment, you can learn quite a bit. Um, and, you know, the other thing that seems that's also kind of obvious is that, you know, usually if you're studying a vaccine, um, you need to, to uh, wait 
So if you're, at least if you're studying whether the vaccine is effective or not, you need to, to wait to see if people are infected naturally. And that might be, you know, it might be 1% of people get infected in a month, 1% in a, in a year. Um, so you need to study in a massive amount of people and it takes a long time. If you just think of, you know, for a challenge trial, you're probably going to have something like 80% of people become infected uh, when they're exposed. And that'll be, you know, in a span of, you know, that, that'll happen within maybe a week of exposure. And so you can have results a few weeks later. Now, now all that's not to say, you know, our, that challenge trials are a perfect replacement um, for these large phase three trials that are um, happening because it's an artificial means of infection. And in, 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 uh, for COVID, it would be um, like a, a nasal dropper, uh, basically. Um, and it's also, you know, with this, this unrepresentative young, healthy population. Um, but it's, it's hugely helpful. They've been helpful in past diseases. And basically, you know, at, at one day sooner, you know, I've been talking about uh, just to explain what challenge trials are so far. And even though we, we have been doing a lot of advocating for, for COVID challenge trials, um, you know, that's not the, the, the core goal of the organization. That's just a, a sort of medium term or instrumental goal based on this underlying goal of advocating for research participants and specifically advocating for people who want to be in uh, COVID challenge trials. And this is something that we're, we're really excited about. We think is a really important addition to the bioethics field and to the medical research field, because we feel like if the people who are the research subjects them, uh, ourselves are uh, empowered within the medical process, it's going to make it easier to do biomedical research in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think, you know, one way we're seeing that is, is with um, the kind of bioethical decision making around, um, around challenge trials, but, but not just these trials and other, other um, studies as well. Because um, if you look, you know, I, I think the, the idea that ethical approval for human subjects research that I, you know, um, what are called institutional review boards in the US or uh, research ethics committees in, in the UK um, are often really cumbersome and, and I think have this, um, uh, they, they can really kind of delay research in, in some ways. That's not to say that we shouldn't have ethical protections, but our hope and what we do is that if you're empowering research participants, so if they're um, part of the medical decision-making process, if they're equal partners with the groups running the, the trials, um, that will make it, you know, allow a lot more research and, and sort of better research than you'd get otherwise. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, the overall sort of, uh, kind of intellectual concept of One Day Sooner. Um, and then sort of like, okay, well, what do we actually do in practice? Um, so we, we've done, basically we're, you know, kind of, there's sort of a, a public advocacy side and a kind of private coordination and, and research side. Um, and on the kind of private coordination side, we've brought together a number of groups that are interested in running challenge trials. And, and I think it provided useful research to, to help kind of facilitate those. So groups like, um, like Oxford, the, the Jenner Institute at, at Oxford, um, who's announced that they, that they are interested in running challenge studies. Uh, also, um, we uh, talked to the National Institutes of Health in the United States, um, which, although Dr. Fauci is not publicly all that um, excited about challenge studies, uh, they are, you know, a lot of the researchers there are really eager to, to move forward and they are preparing um, for these studies, uh, as well as um, Johnson & Johnson and uh, some other groups. And uh, we've done some, some different research. You can go look on our website, um, onedaysooner.org slash research, and you can see, for example, uh, a paper we did in the Journal of Clinical Infectious Diseases about the, the uses of, of challenge studies. Um, so, so a lot of our work that we do is, is this kind of behind the scenes stuff and, and also in, um, in organizing volunteers and in learning you know, what um, the volunteer perspective is. So we've had 37,000 people sign up um, from over 160 countries. And so we are a, a global organization um, and that's an important part of our, our mission is to be advancing things, not just in uh, the United States where I'm from, um, but around the world and, and also not just in, in Western countries, but um, to, be, to be including perspectives from the developing world uh, as well. Um, but the other piece we have, and, and this is sort of what brings us here today, is kind of public advocacy. And we consider a, a big part of our mission to be about educating the public around challenge studies. Uh, and there's been you know, an enormous amount of different press coverage and really all over the world. Um, but, and so one of the things we've, we've done is this open letter in support of studies signed by a number of experts, including Professor Singer and, uh, and 15 Nobel laureates. Um, and what we're doing here is there's a lot of support among different uh, medical professionals in the United Kingdom for challenge studies. 
Uh, and I think there's even some support within um, some, some fairly high places in government uh, for moving forward with them. Um, but, you know, I think there's always going to be, if, if you're a, a politician or if you're uh, running a, a medical institute, um, you know, there's always going to be a, a sort of risk of, oh, well, what's the public reaction going to be uh, to these, these challenge studies? Um, is this something, you know, it's, it's always going to be a bit of a safer pick just to say, you know, yes, this could be useful scientifically. It could help us develop vaccines sooner in different ways, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, we, it, could, it could damage my reputation. And so what we want to do is to provide kind of public cover for this or show, like demonstrate public enthusiasm. Um, and we think that if we can do that, it'll meaningfully move forward the calendar by, by which these studies are, are utilized. Um, and so that's what this uh, petition campaign is, is about. And it's really something where, you know, we're, we're really excited. We have some good press lined up once the petition goes live. Um, but we really think that it's, it's something we're getting to a lot of signatories quickly is going to be really important for, for making it newsworthy and making it um, not, you know, not just newsworthy in general, but also newsworthy in the frame that we want, which is that this is something that's exciting that, that a lot of people want to do and especially want a lot of young people who want to participate in these studies. And so we felt like this was a, um, a really exciting opportunity to get college students in general and the effective altruist community in particular uh, involved because it is so easy to like sign a petition to get someone to sign a petition. So we think that, you know, if we can get like 20 people um, who are college students who are like really passionate about push about, you know, put, advancing this petition, um, as well as, you know, we have about 1700, I think, volunteers in the UK, um, you know, like even, you know, someone who can get 10 people to, to sign up, if we can get 10,000 volunteers uh, or 10,000 petition uh, signatories, I mean, uh, in a week, that's going to be a huge, that's going to be a big news story. That's going to be really, really helpful. And so I feel also, um, uh, I guess before I turn it over um, to, to Peter, I'll say two other things. Um, uh, one of which is going to be about sort of what the path forward and challenge trials actually looks like, how this actually connects to, to, to doing these studies. Um, and two is going to be just a little bit about, about effective altruism uh, advocacy in general. So, um, so just quickly on the challenge studies, it's not that you can't do, you can't um, test the Oxford vaccine tomorrow, for example, in a challenge study. You need to do something called an infectious dosing study to develop this model. Um, and that's the thing we want to kind of start sooner than, than later. There are several efforts to develop that. Um, Oxford's hoping to get theirs ready to start in November. Um, but I did want to sort of frame that it's going to be, you know, it's, it's really a matter of what we want to do is be in a position in early 2021 to be testing a number of different vaccines and treatments so that we have not just, you know, the, the vaccine candidates that are in phase three currently, but that there's some path to, to market for the other 170 or so uh, candidates that are, that are currently being considered. The last thing I'll say um, is just about EA advocacy. And what we hope is that this can be a template, this vision campaign can be a template for, um, uh, ad, you know, it can be replicable for other advocacy campaigns on other EA things in the, the UK, um, that it can be this way of, of getting public attention. So we're hoping to be contributing, not just, you know, obviously selfishly, we're interested in one day sooner in challenge trials, but also we want to be um, uh, kind of building something for the EA community uh, and building some techniques and things that could be useful and, and helpful in general. Um, so yeah, so uh, thanks again for, for coming today and, and we're really excited to be working with you all. Yeah, um, thanks Josh. Uh, so uh, next to talk is uh, Professor Singer. So um, I'll let, without further ado, let Professor Singer take the floor. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to follow uh, Josh who's um, been doing such a lot for uh, altruism for uh, kidney donations and uh, now for one day sooner. I thought the funniest thing you said, Josh, was right at the end where you said, well, obviously, selfishly, we would like one day sooner to be part of this uh, advocacy issue. Um, one day sooner, in case you don't know, is not actually a selfish enterprise. Um, it's an enterprise that is trying to benefit the whole world and everybody who's affected by the pandemic. And uh, I think you know it's it's great that you want to help other effective advocacy causes as well, but don't don't, don't get carried away into thinking uh, that it's selfish if you're promoting one day sooner. Okay, um, I've uh, been asked to do a couple of slightly different things. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the ethics of human challenge trials uh, and why I signed the 
ladder and why I support this and have written about it. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, effective altruism advocacy more broadly and effective altruism itself more broadly. So, um, human challenge trials. Uh, in one sense, you know, I, I think the name one day sooner is pretty self-explanatory when you think about it. Uh, every day that we get a vaccine against uh, the novel coronavirus sooner is going to save lives, um, quite a lot of lives. You can look at what the daily uh, tally is that's, that's rising um, each day. We're talking about thousands of lives worldwide. Uh, of course, getting a vaccine doesn't mean that everybody gets it that day, but still, if everything moves a day quicker, uh, we can be talking about thousands of lives uh, being saved. And not only, of course, the lives lost through the virus, but also the fact that uh, economies can come out of lockdown. And uh, there's a lot of evidence showing that this is really serious in many other ways, apart from deaths from coronavirus. Um, if you follow uh, the Gates Foundation, the work of Bill and Melinda Gates, um, you know that they've been supporting a whole lot of things that save lives unrelated to coronavirus. For example, um, uh, immunization against common diseases that kill large numbers of people throughout the world, more people than are dying from uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and they put out a thing called a, a goalkeeper's report to show how they're going. Um, which is usually pretty positive um, about, yes, we're reducing extreme poverty. Yes, the number of kids who die from these pre preventable diseases is uh, falling. Yes, we're immunizing more people, all of those uh, good things. But if you look at the one that just came out, the September 2020 report, it's actually um, really down um, because of uh, the, the pandemic and because of the way it set back so many other things that they were doing, um, specifically on the question on the immunization programs, uh, the goalkeepers report uh, says that because of the difficulty in getting people out there to do the vaccination in various places now, uh, we're back to seeing the levels of immunization uh, as essentially been put back 25 years. So, so whereas previously it had been steadily growing, uh, right now, we're only immunizing as many people as we were immunizing in 1995. Uh, and that's pretty serious. And that means more kids are going to die from these uh, other diseases as well. So that all adds to the importance of trying to get something that will uh, stop this and make, us, make it possible for us to go back to normal uh, as quickly as possible. Now, um, then the next thing you might ask, well, uh, if people are prepared to volunteer to take part in human challenge trials, and if they do have the potential to shorten the time in which it takes to test the various potential vaccines, um, what's the obstacle? You know, why isn't everyone saying this is fantastic? We've got 37,000 volunteers. Um, let's applaud them for, for doing that and let's make use of them and prepare to do so. Now, as, as, as Justin said, to some extent that is happening uh, with the Oxford uh, Jenner lab. And uh, I'm not as, as up to date as Josh is on, on what's going on with the US government and their preparations. Uh, certainly what uh, Anthony Fauci has been saying publicly has been disappointing. But if more things are going on behind the scenes, that's good. But uh, still, you'd really like to see it much more of a focus of, of what's going on. So, so why isn't it? Well, there's some hesitations, I think, among people in bioethics uh, about, to some extent, bioethics can be conservative. It's um, the things that we've been doing before are less controversial than, than new things. And in terms of experimentation on humans, there's a long history of being very cautious about human experimentation and for very good reasons. Um, a, a lot of the uh, a, a lot of what we have in terms of protection of human subjects comes from things that are, were quite deplorable. Um, uh, for example, the Tuskegee experiments in syphilis that were carried out in the United States, in the Southern uh, United States, where uh, African-Americans who had syphilis were being observed uh, rather than treated 
uh, if the, the study started when there wasn't an effective treatment, but even when penicillin became available and proven to be effective, uh, they were still being observed, not knowing that they were part of an experiment um, about the course of the illness. Um, and of course, the Nazi experiments also um, gave a real boost to the idea that we must have global standards that uh, doctors comply with, that they know that they're not to do harmful things to research subjects without their informed consent. But it is basically all premised on informed consent. And that's why it's somewhat puzzling that when you have volunteers who are giving their consent and whom you can fully inform about the risks they're taking, <coughs> why can't you go ahead with that? Well, to some extent, some people might still think, look, it's different to infect people with a dangerous disease where even if they're young and healthy subjects uh, at lower risk than older people or people with uh, other medical conditions, um, still there's some risk. Uh, some, some young people have died. Some young people have become very seriously ill and had long-term li possibly lasting damage from it. So it's not without risk. That's certainly true. And I think in the medical ethics community, there has been this view that you shouldn't, that, that research shouldn't take precedence over uh, the rights and interests of the research subjects. That's actually uh, a quote from the Declaration of Helsinki, the Declaration of the World Medical Association, the 2013 version says, while the primary purpose of medical research is to generate new knowledge, this goal can never take precedence over the rights and interests of individual research subjects. Well, rights and interest are what's being talked about here. I think when we're talking about rights, um, obviously research subjects have a right to be informed about any experiment that they might be involved in and uh, to refuse to take part in that um, on the basis of, of information about it. But uh, I think it's part of the nature of rights that you can waive your right, um, that if you give your consent, it's not a violation of your rights. Obviously that's true about property rights. If I own something that you would like, well, I have a right to it. You can't just take it from me. But if I decide that, you know, you will make better use of it than I can and I give it to you, it's absolutely no violation of my right to my property for you to say, thank you very much, that's great. Uh, and I think something like this is what's, is what's going on here. Uh, individuals are giving their consent. So there's no violation of their rights. Now you might say, well, but it's still contrary to their interests. You're overriding individual interests for the benefit of knowledge in general. But that's a somewhat narrow view of interests. It suggests that the only thing that we really care about is staying healthy. Um, and while sure, staying healthy is something that we would generally regard as being in our interests. We have other interests as well. And one of our interests, I think, is to live a life in accordance with our values, uh, a life that we feel is meaningful and fulfilling. And we know that we're contributing to making the world a better place. Uh, and the very existence of the effective altruism community shows that that's important for people. Uh, and we can see it in other uh, practices that are not really controversial. For example, um, donating a kidney to a stranger, which is something that I know Josh has done and uh, other people in the EA community have done. Uh, and that although at first it, um, you know, did take a bit of pushing to get uh, hospitals to accept that you were sane, even though you were saying, I want to give my kidney to the next person on your waiting list, um, that is now accepted that that this is something that some people uh, want to do and it's a good thing to do and they can go ahead and it's not completely without risk um, I've seen uh, calculations that say the risk is somewhere between three and uh, one in three thousand one to one in four thousand um, uh, the risk of dying as a result of having only one kidney having given one away uh, so there is uh, there is some risk but um, Nevertheless, we, we do this, we're prepared to do it. So I think that it's reasonable to say that it's, we, can, we shouldn't assume that it's contrary to the interests of somebody who wants to do this, to do it. And that's true both for uh, kidney donation to, to strangers and for taking part in human challenge trials. So, uh, and the risk to that, by the way, is, is uh, 
smaller, if we, if we are talking about young and healthy donors, the risk that you will die from uh, being infected with the virus, even if you didn't get the vaccine, even if you got the placebo, or even if the vaccine is useless, um, is still <coughs> uh, less than, than one in, one in 4,000, um, maybe one in 10,000, I've seen uh, the figure quoted. So um, I think that we, that there isn't really a sound ethical uh, objection on the basis of saying we're overriding the risks and interests of, of the volunteers. The other thing I want to say is something that I argued uh, together with Richard Chappell, who's a uh, former graduate, uh, Princeton graduate student, now an assistant professor at uh, the University of Florida, um, is that we defend a principle we call risk parity. And the risk parity is, says basically, if there are some risks that we are willing to ask people in the community to take, then um, if other people are willing to take a similar risk, and the, the benefit of that is as great or greater uh, than the benefit of the other people who are asking to take the risk, um, then we, we shouldn't re refuse uh, to allow them to take that risk as well. And so the, the comparison here is, for example, with healthcare workers. Obviously, there's been a higher rate of infection from healthcare workers. Um, and yet we, we don't say, oh, you can't go to work. Um, you're, you're running too much of a risk. Uh, we, we're not gonna let you run that risk. Uh, on the contrary, we're grateful for healthcare workers for showing up to, for, for work. Uh, but the risk to healthcare workers is no greater, um, oh, sorry, the risk to, to human challenge trial volunteers is probably no greater than the risk to, to healthcare workers. Um, for various reasons, including the fact that they're doing this under supervision and as Josh said, can be monitored from the time they get infected. So, um, uh, how is it that we're prepared to allow healthcare workers to take those risks and not prepared to allow fully informed uh, volunteers for trials? Uh, I can't see much basis for that. So I do think that the ethics uh, of uh, human challenge trials with informed volunteers is uh, reasonably straightforward. Um, and I, th I think that we should be confident in saying that there is, there is no ethical violation that is involved here. Then let, the next question is, well, how do we go about advocating this? And uh, more generally, how should we go about advocating uh, effective altruism? I think that uh, the things that One Day Sooner is doing uh, do, so, do, do so ways in which we can advocate for this issue. Uh, and I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled that it, it hasn't got more attention. I was just discussing this with, with Josh um, before the, we began the program. Uh, you would have thought that there's so much about the pandemic in the news, there's so much concern, there's news about every vaccine that's being tested or not being tested, or whether the Chinese or the Russians are going to skip some of the testing. Uh, there are articles by um, people who've volunteered for the safety trials. Um, there's still rather little awareness of um, human challenge trials uh, in terms of the benefits that they could confer in, term, in, in getting a vaccine faster. Uh, are there other things that we could be doing? Um, I've, I've been involved in um, various causes over, over my life in terms of trying to get attention for things that I regard as ethically right. Um, one of them is, is the, the animal movement since I uh, wrote Animal Liberation back in 1975. I've been involved in that movement from the beginning, you could say, of the modern animal rights movement. Uh, obviously, times change and means are different uh, for spreading the word and getting messages around. But um, I think it's interesting to look at some of the things that uh, were done there uh, that can be effective. And, and I think part of them is, is trying to get some focus and attention uh, on uh, the people who are uh, blocking what's happening trying to, to go to them and to see, uh, well, why isn't this happening? Uh, is there something more you can do about it? Um, I've uh, been very influenced by one of the, I think, great tacticians of the animal movement, uh, a man called Henry Spira, uh, who I met while I was still writing Animal Liberation in 1974 in New York, uh, and who sadly died in 1998. Uh, I wrote a book about him called uh, Ethics Into Action, which uh, describes some of the tactics he uses he used um, 
And uh, he would always approach everybody in a spirit of saying, look, I'm sure you're a reasonable person. I'm sure you'll be willing to do this when you understand the, the, the relevant facts. Um, and sometimes that would work and people would in fact immediately change, but sometimes various kinds of pressure were needed, including uh, the threats of bad publicity. So obviously if you're somebody who's, let's say, uh, running Revlon and uh, uh, Spira comes up to you and says, look, I've got Freedom of Information Act showing that uh, your cosmetics are being put into the eyes of unanesthetized rabbits, that you're blinding rabbits uh, for the sake of beauty. Um, do you think that's something your customers are likely to not want to know about? Um, so there's a sort of, a, a, if you like, a veiled threat that um, there, are, there are things that, are, that could make your company look bad. And I think in, you know, Josh talked a little bit about the fact that the safe thing seems to be just to say, you know, no, we'll stick with the status quo. But I think that there could be ways of saying, um, you're, you're going to be responsible for the deaths of thousands of people more uh, if you don't use this. And people are going to want to know, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you take this opportunity to uh, save lives and to get us get everybody out of the lockdown and out, get the economy humming uh, normally again. So I, th I think there are things that can be perhaps learnt from the animal movement in terms of how you advocate for specific causes. And I think this is, this is an interesting, uh, Josh referred to it as a possible template for the uh, effective altruism movement. I think it is an interesting new development in that movement because generally speaking, the effective altruism movement has been concerned with uh, uh, getting people to donate money to the most effective charities and getting people to pursue careers that will be effective and will benefit people. So um, I think I'd see those as the, the two major things that effective altruism has been doing to improve the world um, with the question of donating money, uh, the dominant one, since you know, there are more people who can donate money than are still at the stage where they can make career choices. Uh, and that's, that's been good and I think it's worked and we do certainly have um, substantial sums, um, hundreds of millions of, of pounds or dollars flowing to more effective charities because of the EA movement. Uh, I think there's still things that we can learn about doing that um, and we are learning more things. There's research going on, a uh, number of people in psychology uh, are, going, are doing research of various kinds about how you get people to give more effectively. And I think there'll be some interesting work coming out on that um, over the next couple of years. Uh, that's very useful. Um, but uh, this is really something new, I think, that um, we're talking now about how the effective altruism movement can bring about change in a very effective way without necessarily having to have money to donate or having to make career choices, which is to say, you know, people, people don't make many career choices during their, during their lives. Um, uh, so you can't always catch people at the moment when they can make a career choice, but you can, for this sort of thing, catch people in a moment when they can do something like volunteering for a human challenge trial. Uh, and I'm sure that there are other things that we can think of that uh, effective altruists can advocate for, uh, where there's something that is not sort of really ethically controversial or politically partisan, um, but is a straightforward way in which you can say, uh, look, here's something that we're not doing that we could be doing that people would be willing to do. Um, and that those who want to contribute to making the world a better place can have an opportunity for doing so. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's really interesting because I think it is important to try to broaden the, the, the scope of altruism to ha make it easier for more people to act altruistically so that we change the paradigm from people um, acting, you know, assuming that the norm is to act in your own interests, assuming that the norm is to try to earn more money, to have a nicer car, a bigger house, take more expensive holidays and so on, to uh, try to get people to see that at least there's an alternative norm that many people follow. And that is to think that it's really important to contribute to making the world a better place. So if we can find more opportunities for effective altruists to do that and to advocate for both the specific goals and the general norm of acting altruistically, uh, I think we'll be broadening the EA movement and we'll be making a positive difference to the world as well. Thanks very much.
Great. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I know I learned a lot there. That was, that was really, really interesting. Uh, cool. So um, I'll move on now um, and quickly speak about um, specifically um, the, the efforts we're making uh, in the UK. So I'll start by sharing uh, in the chat the link to the full petition text. Um, uh, but the, the essential rundown is that we're asking, uh, in our petition, we're asking the UK government to construct uh, a challenge trial centre for um, to kind of, um, you know, have, have su sufficient biocontainment capacity to um, uh, house, you know, maybe 100 to 200 challenge trial volunteers. Uh, and we think that's a nice ask because it's really, you know, it's obvious what it's for and it's solid and it's actionable. Um, so we can, you know, we can really see something happen. Uh, so that's currently under review by the Petitions Committee at the moment and we're hoping that will go live uh, at some time next week. Um, also in the UK, it's, uh, I can't not talk about uh, our efforts with college effective altruism groups. So we are being co-hosted this morning by four uh, college effect effective altruism groups from Durham, Oxford, York and Warwick. Um, they've been really helpful in setting up the, setting up the event um, and doing that kind of thing. So uh, my thanks to them. Um, and we're hoping to kind of expand our, you know, our reach and, and talk to universities and so on about um, both the petition and that, you know, in general uh, efforts. Uh, so I'll share the link to the petition text uh, in the chat. Again, hopefully we can uh, get that live sometime next week um, and get that shared around, shared around one day sooner. Uh, and hopefully plenty of you will come along and sign it. Uh, again, we're hoping to have uh, we're hoping to get around 10,000 signatures on that because with 10,000 signatures you can force a government response in writing and with 100,000 signatures you can actually force a debate in Parliament. So to get to that, that petition then has generated some solid uh, So uh, there's not too much to say on the, the UK uh, apart from that, so I'll move on nice and quickly to some Q&A. Uh, so again, there's a Google Docs uh, if you'd like to submit questions. Um, a lot of people have submitted quite a few questions already. Um, so probably a good one to start with, I think, is that um, just a question to the floor. Uh, what do you think of the various arguments that challenge trials won't speed up vaccine development that much? Yeah, I'll, I'll take um, that one. So I think that I think there's there's two different two different ideas and, and two different parts of that argument. One is I think a strong argument. One is a is is not that strong. So I think the you know when when challenge trials were originally proposed for COVID nineteen in this article by um, that I mentioned in the Journal of Infectious Disease um, by by Nirayal, Mark Lipsitch, and, and Peter Smith, um, you know the the main justification it was explaining uh, was was basically to use them as a replacement. Um, for those large phase three studies. And, you know, I, and so some of the response has been, well, you know, it was going to take too long to set up challenge studies um, to, to serve as that, that replacement. And also that, that you're not a perfect replacement. You need to do not necessarily the same size of study or the same duration, but you need to do some sort of large scale uh, safety testing. And so there's a question of, oh, well, you know, we're doing these phase three studies now. Why do you, why do you need, need challenge trials, right? Maybe if, you know, the, there was, um, there were scientists at the NIH, there's an article in Vox about this, who, um, who recommended to, to start preparing back in early March. If we had done that, maybe we could have um, sped things up faster than the, the initial phase threes. But um, now that we're, we're in phase three for a number of, of candidates, why do we need challenge trials? Um, so I think that, that as an objection to kind of the, the simplest and, and sort of most intuitive and boldest of, oh, you could speed up things by multiple months um, for, you know, faster than the first phase threes, I think that's a fair objection. But I think there's a lot of ways um, the challenges are going to be useful uh, beyond the initial phase three, and we're going to need other vaccines beyond the ones that are currently candidates. And so there's a few different, few different elements of that. One is um, the first vaccine to be developed, to be approved, um, is probably not going to be the best vaccine that ever is, is developed, right? Hopefully, you know, we, we certainly hope that um, the, you know, that all of, you know, Moderna's and Oxford's and uh, Pfizer's and the others in phase three work extremely well and are 90% effective and have no safety issues. That's just not the likelihood based on historical experience. 
Um, and so most likely what you're going to need to do is you're going to have um, like a this sort of second generation vaccine development, which can be better in, in different ways um, where, you know, you can find a vaccine that might be more effective that, you know, maybe the first generation vaccines will be 60% effective and a second generation could be 80% effective. Or there, there's other sort of delivery pieces that are that are relevant, right? So one is that um, basically all the current, I, I think all, yeah, all the current vaccines that are in phase three testing um, require two doses. Uh, I think one might actually require three, but there's, there's a, they require a booster shot. Um, ideally, you know, it might be possible to develop a vaccine that doesn't require that, or it could be a possible to develop a vaccine that is orally taken rather than taken with, with a shot. Um, and those would both be, uh, actually, so I'll give one other, other example of that, which is that um, some of the vaccines, or a lot of them require what's called a cold chain of, of um, you know, uh, sub-zero storage. So in particular, uh, the mRNA vaccines, Moderna's and, and Pfizer's, um, both require, you know, quite cold temperatures, could be quite difficult to distribute those um, lots of places, but particularly in low and middle income countries. Um, so one way the challenges are going to be useful is these second generation vaccines, and particularly the idea that you have, you know, I kind of mentioned like 170 different candidates, you can't do, um, you know, 30,000 person studies for every one of those candidates that um, has some, some evidence of uh, immunogenicity of, of generating an immune response. So instead, um, what you'd use challenge studies to do is to, um, to prioritize which ones look like they're gonna be very, very effective, right? And, that's, and that can speed up that second generation of vaccines by, by months potentially, right? Um, you also, you know, you could imagine a world, there's sort of two um, kind of downside scenarios that challenge studies protect against that are, that are very important. One is, um, you know, it's, it's possible that the current vaccine candidates in phase three don't work. Uh, we, you know, probably that's, that's not going to be the case. There should be at least one that um, will be fairly effective. Um, but we don't know that yet, right? And in that world, um, it's going to be really helpful to be able to demonstrate effectiveness much, much more quickly with, with the challenge study. But the other piece is that um, from a, oh, the other thing that can happen too is, let's say that you do get a vaccine that's approved. Um, and there's two things that could, could happen then. One is it might become difficult to get, you know, 20,000 people to sign up to take, to be in an experiment um, when there's already a vaccine that's, that's available. Um, and two, transmission rates might go down to the extent, which is a good thing, or at least they might go down in countries where it's easy to test vaccines. Um, but, you know, transmission rates, rates won't necessarily go down um, in countries where the vaccines haven't been, uh, haven't been deployed. And so it might be necessary to, to use challenge studies to, um, to test the efficacy of a vaccine. Uh, the final thing, so, so that's, that's sort of, um, uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, two, two last, last thoughts on this. One is um, when you hear about how many doses have been committed by different vac vaccine candidates, you have to remember this thing about the booster part, which is that when people say, you know, oh, like um, Pfizer, I read, I think today said they could produce a billion doses in 2021. Now that's an amazing achievement. Um, it's it's uh, I, I, it's it's a huge um, it, it's it's hugely impressive. But that means vaccinating 500 million people, right? And so what we want, you know, we want to get as close as possible to vaccinating everyone in the world in 2021. That at least should be what we're aiming at. And to do that, we're going to need to get lots of vaccines to to be approved. And challenges are going to be uniquely useful for that. The final thought. Because um, I don't want to go on for too long, but is there's a number of kind of scientific questions that challenges can answer um, that are really valuable. And so one way you should think of challenges is that, like, if you could learn more about the disease in 2021, is that a good thing? Is that is that worth making some sacrifices to do? And it seems, you know, I, I think that it's easy to be sort of short sighted and to hope and be like, oh, well, you know, we're going to get this vaccine and then we're, we're done. But that's not true. Right. And it's, it's important to, to address some of these scientific questions. Um, some questions are, you know, how long does immunity last and what does that immunity look like? In particular, what you can find out with a challenge study um, are what's called correlates of protection. What does the immune response look like when it's going to be effective? Because if you can find out what that is, you can see if a vaccine produces that and then you don't have to um, necessarily wait to test effectiveness for the vaccine if you know that it produces those correlates of protection. And challenge studies are uniquely valuable for, for that. So I do think that the, the critics of challenge studies make a fair point that, you know, sort of the most optimistic earliest case um, for them of this could, you know, vastly speed up the initial generation of candidates that hasn't been borne out because they haven't been prepared quickly enough. Um, but I do think there's a, a number of different uses that they can, can have 
um, throughout uh, 2021. Uh, great. Okay. Um, and that, that answers that one. So um, I think the second question, um, this one uh, specifically to Professor Singer, um, do we need to think about pandemic ethics closer to humanitarian and disaster ethics um, rather than traditional medical research ethics? Uh, because in, you know, it's such a unique scenario where delays translate to deaths. <coughs> Yes, I think the answer to that uh, is that ethics in a pandemic is somewhat different from ethics in more normal times. Uh, <clears throat> and that's, that's because the stakes are, are clearly higher. Um, you might say in normal times, you would not uh, need to use human challenge trials uh, because you could take plenty of time to other trials, there would be no great urgency. Um, I'm not actually sure even whether that's correct. And I think Josh has just given some reasons why it might not be in terms of getting a full scientific picture of, of what's going on. So I think there, there would be benefits from human challenge trials anyway. But um, the stakes are certainly higher when, when more people are dying and when uh, the urgency of getting uh, the best possible vaccine uh, is there and uh, I think that that means that it's worth taking somewhat more risks for for higher stakes. As any 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 gambler will tell you, you know, you uh, that's that's expected utility. You um, are prepared to stake more in order to in order to win more, gain more. And I think I think we we ought to be thinking in that way too. We still want to be careful. We still want to do what we can to protect uh, the interests of individuals. But um, we it's it's more understandable that people are prepared to take risks when uh, the gain is likely to be much greater. Uh, great, okay, thanks. So uh, the next question, uh, I've just been trying to sort of pick the best one. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. Um, given that we don't know what in particular the, the long-term consequences of, of coronavirus might be, um, we simply have, have no idea, um, and they could be quite severe, how informed do you think informed consent could actually be without us knowing that, those bits of information? And do you think that's a particular problem for, for challenge trials, ethically speaking? I've certainly heard the, the objection that um, people say, well, you can't really give informed consent because you don't, we don't know enough about the disease to inform you. So if we can't inform you, how can you give informed consent? But <clears throat> informed consent is always relative to uh, what is known and what you have to know is, is what the unknowns are. So if you're informed that, okay, this is what we know about the disease, this is what uh, looks like the statistics indicate, but uh, the disease has only been around for this period of time. Therefore, we can't be sure that there aren't going to be long-term consequences. Um, then uh, you are still giving your informed consent to, to participate in that situation. You've been accurately informed about what the risks are, including the unknown risks. And uh, that's true of new medical treatments in general. Uh, there has to be some sort of caveat that uh, we don't know everything about this. That's virtually always the case. So um, that's not new in terms of obtaining patients informed consent to, to inform them that, there are, that we don't precisely know what all the risks are. So uh, I don't see that as an obstacle. I just see it as something that needs to be clearly expressed in obtaining the informed consent of volunteers. Yeah, and I'll add to that um, that you know, most like most most of life is is uncertain. We don't know what the the outcomes of our of our actions are, are going to be. Um, and there's a number of places. You know, most times you you take a risk. You don't know what the the risks are going to be when someone signs up to be in the military. Um, they don't know. You know, the chance of them being sent to war. If you send someone to war, you don't know the chance that um, that you could be uh, injured or, or killed. Um, and similarly, you know, um, going back to the the healthcare worker example that the Professor Singer I think raised earlier. Um, you know, we didn't know, particularly at the beginning of the um, of the pandemic, what the risks were going to be um, to healthcare workers, and those risks have, have evolved over time. And no one would say, "Oh, well, it's not ethical to 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 let people be a doctor or be a nurse um, uh, in during a, a pandemic." 
but but that's again you, you don't know what the the risk is in that case and so you just have to inform people the the best that we we know and let people make a reasonable decision with uncertainty because that's just what it is to to be human um the last thing i'll, I'll say is um, because you know, people compare this to so to kidney donation, and like Professor Singer said, I'm a um, kidney donor, and it's it's worth knowing that um, I think people, you know, um, I think bioethicists think of kidney donation as something for which we know the the risks really, really, really well, um, because we've been doing it for like 50 years. Um, and again, you know, so when I donated, for example, uh, which was in 2011, at that point. Uh, there, there wasn't evidence that there was an increase in your chance of kidney failure if you donated. The reason for that is it's epidemiologically difficult uh, to figure out because um, being, you know, kidney donors are healthier than average. The, the absolute risks are kind of low. It's hard to get the comparison population, things like that. And it was in 2014, um, there was a, a paper that came out that said, actually, it increases your risk of kidney donation. The, the scary way of putting this is that it's by about a factor of 10. The, the less scary way of putting that is it takes your risk from 0.1% to, to 1%. Um, that doesn't mean that, that I couldn't have given informed consent in 2011. And it certainly doesn't mean that people shouldn't have been allowed to donate um, back in 2011. And so I, I do think, um, you know, in the last example I'll give is, is, is sort of more of a question, which is, um, do people, you know, like, what are, how, like, what are the, um, the long-term risks of getting pregnant? Right, and I think that one thing to, to think about is is how well do we know the, those risks, and you know, just someone, how well does someone getting pregnant actually have a sense of, of those risks? That there are things like um, preeclampsia, and so high blood pressure during pregnancy can cause high blood pressure later in life. Different things like that, and I think the interesting thing isn't so much you know, so partly it's uh, like how much is this known, but it's also how much does the average person know. Um, and so I do think that this idea that oh well we don't know every last thing. Well, sorry. The idea that there are, I don't need to, to poop the idea. The, there are significant uncertainties about, about COVID. That's a very real concern, but that doesn't mean that people can't make decisions about, about COVID. Yeah, thanks for that. So um, the next question uh, is, challenge trials would presumably be limited to young, healthy volunteers. Uh, and that's probably not representative of, in fact, it isn't of the general population. So does this lack of diversity in the sample have any implications for the validity of trials and then the validity of bringing vaccines to market? Mm -hmm. So um, this, yeah, so this goes to, to this relevant point that the challenge studies have limitations. Um, so there's a couple of different things to, to see about this. First is if you could only, uh, even if, um, you can't tell anything about unhealthy people and elderly people based on challenge trials in young healthy people. Having a vaccine that works for, for young healthy people would be really great, right? That would be, be a really useful thing to, to have. And also that, you know, vaccine trials them, themselves, um, you know, it's not as restricted to, um, to young healthy people as challenge trials, of course, um, but they are a restricted population. And so we probably will be vaccinating people who are at risk um, based on results that we get from a vaccine study among, among healthy people. Um, what I've been told by, I, I think, well, so, so two things. So one, the, the World Health Organization, when they um, put together their kind of blueprint about COVID-19 challenge trials, um, were split. Uh, I think it was something like the, the, the majority of the experts on the panel said, you can't uh, project risks from the, or the, the effectiveness of the challenge trial to an elderly population or a sick population. Um, but, but a slight, like a slight minority, so I think it was, I think the vote was like 10 to seven, said, yes, you could, you could project it to that population. But I think the thing to realize, well, let's say two things. One is that um, it's not that, let's say you do a challenge trial on 18 to 25. It's not that that's only relevant for 18 to 25. What, what scientists have told, told um, me is that it's, you know, the, a, a healthy 45 year old or a healthy 50 year old is going to have basically the same type of immune response um, as, a, as a healthy 22 year old. Uh, it might be a little bit weaker, things like that, but that, that should, you know, that it's not controversial that that's going to, to be useful. The question is, is, is it going to project effectively to um, an elderly person or, or someone with significant comorbidities? And the final thing is, is that there are scientific things you can learn, these questions of uh, correlations, uh, correlates of protection things like that, that are going to be relevant in later populations. So if you find that, for example, when you challenge someone who's already had COVID and you see what their immune system does and why it's effective, 
if um, someone who's elder, if you give a vaccine to someone who's elderly and their body is producing the same antibodies that are effective correlates of protection in the young person, we can feel confident that they're going to be protected as the elderly person um, because they're, they're producing those same, um, same biomarkers. Yeah, great, okay. Um, sorry, it's, yeah, okay. Uh, so a question uh, to put to Peter um, is that, do you think there should be any upper cap to the level of acceptable risk uh, in human subjects research? Uh, so I think, um, I think it a lot depends on the circumstances and to say that there should be an upper cap, I think is perhaps, you know, is, if that's applying no matter what the circumstances is um, probably, my answer to that would be no. Um, and just to follow up on the, the previous question, um, I had a conversation with a, a colleague about human challenge trials and mentioned that the proposal was that uh, young healthy volunteers would be able to do this. And uh, she said, well, why only young healthy people? Why not people who are in fact very ill, who are terminally ill? Um, somebody who's worked for a long time on issues like voluntary euthanasia and physician assistance in dying. Um, and of course there are people who have been told, in fact, this is the way that a lot of the physician assistance in dying legislation is, is framed um, in California, in fact, the whole of the Western United States and in Canada and, and here where I am in Victoria in Australia, um, that doctors tell you that you have no more than six months to live. So if somebody is in that situation, they, they have an illness and uh, doctors say, uh, I'd be prepared to sign that you only have, you have less than six months to live so that you can have physician assistance in dying, then um, why should that person not also be able to say, okay, and I'd like to volunteer for a human challenge trial so that my last months can be meaningful, can, can contribute something positive to the world. And after all, um, yes, of course, I recognize that there's a higher risk that I will die from the virus. But uh, on the other hand, what am I losing? Um, at the most six months of not very great quality of life. So um, now you might say, well, okay, so this, this still, they're not running a great risk because of their only having a few months to live. But, but if you put risk in terms of the risk that they will die from getting infected with a virus, the risk is extremely high. But uh, I think that point was a sound one. I wouldn't put any cap on it, again, if they're fully informed and they're prepared to make that choice. Great, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I think um, that's probably uh, a kind of a good point to to stop um, the Q&A there. So um, we'll move now. So I'll just I'll say sort of thanks to you, Josh. Thanks to uh, Professor Singer for, for giving up your time this morning to come and talk to us. It's been I find it really interesting uh, and really kind of quite inspiring. Uh, and thanks also to the four uh, EA groups. So that's Durham, Warwick, uh, York and Oxford um, from uh, England who've helped us um, set up and publicize the event. Uh, so now we can uh, move to smaller breakout rooms. So um, that's optional. It's kind of uh, 20 or so minutes, um, just a chance to kind of socialize, to network and talk about, you know, any, you know, ways of spreading the petition, any, you know, whatever questions you might have, um, just a good way to kind of socialize in a, in a smaller group. And yeah, well, actually, just right before we, we do that, let me just, um, in terms of uh, kind of next steps or, or how people can get involved, um, you know, like, like I said, you know, the goal of this, this for us is trying to get, you know, some passionate um, EA and other, other um, kind of volunteers to be helping with, with the petition and, and wanting to, to share this. Um, and so, you know, the petition should go live. We're, we're hoping next week. Um, it just takes some time for them to, to process it. And um, we want to make sure that this, this draft gets approved. Um, but if you're, you know, we, we would really love for this to be something, you know, two things, I think. One, you know, people are, are signing themselves, sharing on social media, asking friends, things like that. But also, I, I think that, you know, we, we would love to have um, kind of a, a, you know, a core of, of people um, in universities in the UK who are, you know, maybe uh, doing other, we can do other events like this with other um, uh, student groups um, and who are just kind of helping with this campaign in general. I think there's a lot that we can do. To, to spread the word about this and to get people to, to sign. Um, and I think that can be, be really useful. And, and like I said, can be a, a template 
both a template for, for other um, advocacy campaigns, we're hoping, and also I, I think be something, you know, something concrete in terms of, you know, I mean, it's not to say that everyone who's an EA has to agree that challenge trials are a great idea, but, you know, this is something that like people can, can advocate for, the people who are EAs are, are passionate about making a difference in the world. Um, and doing things that are concrete and effective and, and high cost cost benefit. And I think like the cost benefit to like signing a petition um, is is pretty pretty high for the inconvenience of it. Um, so if you're interested, um, we'll share, uh, you can definitely always email me. I'm josh at onedaysooner.org. Um, AB is ab at onedaysooner.org. Alistair is his whole name at, at onedaysooner.org. Yeah. It's difficult to read. But um, uh, and, and yeah, we, we would love for you to get more involved um, and could definitely, definitely use the, the help. Uh, so I'll just add to that, um, all, uh, all of our email addresses are just on the, on the website. So if you just go to www.onedaysooner.org, uh, you'll be able to find our email addresses is there. Okay. Um, so I think that's, that's a good time to stop and, and move to breakout rooms. Thanks, everyone.